bottom line with all of this is that all of these guys are going to participate in the blockchain movement. Each one fills a different role and each one works a little bit differently. My name's Christian, and I was going to go through a quick presentation of a couple of different protocols that are all vying for supremacy when it comes to layer one, um, in Polkadot's case, layer zero blockchains. So we're going to go through Polkadot and Solana and Cardano. We'll spend a little bit more time on Polkadot and Solano because this is a Cardano meetup. So hopefully everybody here is familiar with everything, but we'll go through a little bit of their pros and cons, who's doing what and what you can expect here in the next couple of months. So we'll start off with Polkadot. What is it? What does it do? How does it work? It is a blockchain of blockchains. It's a it's supposed to be an interoperability blockchain that allows all of the other blockchains to communicate. So Gavin Wood, who's the founder of Polkadot, is um, a very big proponent for being able to connect all systems. They do that through creating a relay chain, which Polkadot uses, and then parachains, which is a type of sharding mechanism that allows different blockchains on the outside of Polkadot to run and do all of their computations, smart contracts, that type of thing. And then they all can speak to each other through the relay chain, which is the Polkadot system. Polkadot has some really good documentation and their wiki is incredible. It goes through just about everything that you want to know about Polkadot, how to stake it, what wallets to use, how it works. Their parachain option is upcoming right now. And in fact, it's underway. So we'll be finding out who wins the first round of the parachain options here in just a second. If you're not familiar with Polkadot, they also have a a uh, canary, canary system called Kusama, which is another blockchain, which launched their first parachain auctions this summer and had a incredible response to it. Their value shot up tremendously and a lot of the uh, protocols that won slots on the parachain auctions did incredibly well. Um, some of them being like Moon River and Kohala and a few of the other ones. But if you have any questions at all about Polkadot, I do recommend their Polkadot wiki, which really gives you a great overview of how it works and what goes on inside the Polkadot ecosystem. When it comes to the parachain auctions and what's going on right now, you can see most of it at parachains.info. It's got what happened in the Kusama parachain auctions, and you can see Moon River, Shiden, Kara, Bitfrost, Kala Networks, they were the first set of winners there on the um, crowd loans and the um, parachain auctions that went on on Kusama. And now we're on Polkadot, we're in a really fun time where the auctions are just starting to take place. The first set will be November 11th through the 18th, and then the second set will happen shortly thereafter, that week after that. They'll finish up here with the first set on December 16th. Some of the favorites right now, Akala, Moonbeam, Aster, Parallel, Manta. There's also a couple of other ones, Clover, Equilibrium. So these 12 are all vying for pair chain slots. Five of them will get the first slots and will be uh, indoctrinated into the Polkadot system and can start doing their development and rolling out their applications and protocols right on, so on top of Polkadot. So um, there's a lot of buzz right now. You can stake your Polkadot coins if you want to, um, your tokens with these different blockchains and you'll earn rewards depending on what it is that their system looks like. And you can kind of get a good idea about all the protocols as well. So that's basically how the uh, Polkadot systems are functioning. When he goes to Solana, you're talking about a different type of blockchain completely. Solana is more of what you would picture to be in Ethereum. It is a layer one blockchain that is really focused in on the speed of use and the ease of use as well. So Solana's claim to fame is their transactions per second, which they're verifying right now at about 40,000 transactions per second, incredibly fast network and also to incredibly cheap uh, fraction of a penny for every single transaction inside of the Solana network. It has grown tremendously, was at one point number three in the crypto ecosystem and it's fallen back a little bit but it still has a market cap of in the $60 billion range. 
Solana has a pretty good documentation system as well. They really talk about what you can do and how you can do it on the Solana network. It's a little bit different in terms of how they work their consensus mechanism, which is how they basically prove their blockchain consensus and, and place blocks into the chain. They use what's called a proof of history. It's similar to proof of stake and, and very, very similar. Um, Polkadot uses proof of stake, Cardano uses proof of stake, Solana uses what's called proof of history. It's basically a proof of stake system, but also includes timestamps on each one of the blocks. So as the validators are putting blocks into the blockchain, each one's timestamp so that it can move quicker in theory than if you just did typical proof of stake, which is the uh, validators then have to consensus, have a consensus on who came first to make sure that everything fits into the block accordingly. So it takes a little bit more time to build that consensus mechanism and to insert those blocks inside the chain. And that's why Solana with their proof of history is very um, efficient when it comes to their timestamp blocks and they can go into the chain uh, a lot quicker than some of the other blocks that are out there. So when it comes to all of these protocols, you're gonna wanna have a wallet. And unfortunately, there's not a great wallet for everything right now. Solana has their own Phantom wallet. Polkadot has a couple, the Fearless wallet. There's also to a, a Polka wallet. They all do things a little bit differently, but the goal is to have something that's mobile, that allows you to have access to your crypto wherever you are, um, allows you to stake your crypto and to do the things that you wanna do with it. Um, and to hopefully not lose it, of course, is the main thing. Your uh, crypto wallet is completely independent and it is, uh, other than your seed phrase, you really have no way of recovering if you lose anything. So the one thing about crypto, which is um, a little bit difficult is that there's so many different wallets that are out there from MetaMask on Ethereum to Cardano's Daedalus wallet to the Polka wallet to the Phantom wallet on Solana and a couple of other ones. There are a lot of different ways to keep and hold your crypto and, and have to keep track of everything as well. So that goes over a little bit of how Polkadot works, how Solana works. And then, um, as you know, Cardano is one of my favorites. It's a, uh, it's, a very um, well thought out blockchain. It doesn't move as quickly as some of the other ones. You'll see the Solanas that really rolled out from um, inception. Uh, 2019 was pretty much when they came on the scene and now they're fully functional. Polkadot, same thing about 2018, 2019. Cardano's being developed since 2016, um, but it does have a very, very robust, rigorous, um, eh, basically been thought out, been um, very well documented, and um, all of their development to date is all public. It's all out there and you, you can see exactly how it works. And, you know, the uh, smart contracts were just rolled out here and they're being developed right now. And there's going to be a lot that happens in the next couple of months. Um, the main thing about all three of these chains is that they come from very smart people. And this is some of the Ethereum um, founding class. You'll see, you know, Charles Hoskinson uh, back about seven or eight years ago. And here's Gavin Wood, the founder of Polkadot, and obviously Vitalik, who is the founder of Ethereum. Solana was more of a product that was built out of Qualcomm, which is here in San Diego. And the founder was a very, very smart gentleman, engineer, and he uh, created Solana based on the fact that he loved going to Solana Beach here in San Diego. But the rest of these guys are all blockchain pioneers. Gavin Wood, it's, it's said that he uh, wrote the Solidity programming language in a weekend, which is probably a little hyperbole, but um, Gavin's an incredibly smart individual and Polkadot is a, a very well thought out uh, blockchain. The one thing that I love about Cardano is that they're really trying to fit into a niche that's different from your Polkadots and your Solanas and your Ethereums as well. Cardano is really kind of going from the ground up. They're really building a movement and it's focused mostly right now in Africa. The ID system, the Itala Prism project, um, their uh, investment from the Emergo portion of the business into Africa has been incredibly significant and they continue to make strides with helping the basics of the economics in different countries start to form from the ground up. And I think that they're going to get a lot of really good 
adoption from people that really need this technology the most. So they're going to really start from that foundational value system and kind of move their way up the chain, um, for lack of a better word there. But, um, you know, the Polkadot system is really focused in on solving kind of the interoperability between blockchains, between your Bitcoins, your Ethereums, your Solanas, your Cardanos, everything together. And then you've got your Solana, which basically is the fast, cheap, easy way to do any blockchain type of transaction. So you got your Cardanos on one side that are really founding a movement and a different way of doing business. You've got um, Solana, which is basically saying we're going to do what Ethereum does, but we're going to do it 10 times faster or 100 times faster and 100 or 1,000 times cheaper. And then you've got Polkadot that's there to connect the entire thing. So how does that all fit together in the great scheme of what's going on with market caps and valuations right now? You've got Cardano in the number five spot, as you can see currently, valued at about $67 billion. Solana, which was up at number three and now has fallen back a little bit down to number six right behind Cardano, but they've been pretty much neck and neck. And then you've got Polkadot here at number eight, which is about $50 billion right now. But with their parachain auctions and the things that were just announced, they've jumped up tremendously just in the last couple of weeks as they prepare to roll out everything and get the parachains up and going. So you've got three really big contenders here. You've got the the big boy on the block, Ethereum, which is not going away and is going to be around. I guess the, the bottom line with all of this is that all of these guys are going to participate in the blockchain movement. Each one fills a different role and each one works a little bit differently. As we move towards Ethereum version 2.0, assuming that's going to roll out at some point next year, it will be in the same boat as um, basically your Solanas and your Cardanos. Um, it is a little bit more of a legacy blockchain, though, and there's some issues that they need to work through, but there are smart people working on all these projects, and they're all going to be around for a long time. Bitcoin, obviously, is the store of value. It's the granddaddy of them all, um, but at some point, there's going to be a flippening where you've got your smart contract chains that are probably going to take control and become the plumbing for the entire crypto space. So. That's kind of my presentation in a nutshell. Hope you enjoyed it. If you guys have any questions at all about anything, feel free to put them in the chat. Or if you want to unmute yourself and talk about you know, anything, I'm happy to chat with you for the next couple of minutes. Make sure if you haven't um, and you can like this meet up and share it with other people. I'm obviously trying to grow the community as much as I can. I'm learning alongside with you, but I love finding out about everything crypto when it comes to what's happening um, i feel like it's ever evolving and can't um you know everything moves incredibly quickly but i try to stay up with it as much as i possibly can and there's always exciting things going on from the you know polka dot parachain auctions right now which again could be incredibly lucrative for staking your polka dot tokens into some of these projects and earning their native tokens from moonbeam to akala or whatever other ones that you're interested in to the Solana blockchain, which is rolling out tons of new protocols and programs every single day here. And then with the Cardano blockchain, which is basically just starting to find its footing. The smart contracts now are starting to roll out. The NFTs in Cardano have really started to flourish. And there's a lot of larger NFT projects that have come online in the last couple of weeks that are really taking foot. And uh, the Biggest Cardano happening is probably going to be with Sunday Swap here, their first big DEX project that rolls out in the next couple of weeks and kind of launches their entire ecosystem, starts to build that liquidity, which all blockchains are really looking to do, uh, get as much liquidity into the system as possible. You'll see Solana has about $10 billion in liquidity right now. Polkadot obviously is newer. As soon as the uh, parachains come out too, they're going to start to build their liquidity through the, the parachain um, process and getting, you know, DeFi projects and stable coins and everything else in the system. And Ethereum is the, you know, the big boy on the block there where they have about $200 billion or so in, in liquidity on the, the network. Let's take a look really quick. Um, comments about Terra Luna and Avalanche. Definitely. I love Terra Luna. It's one of my favorite blockchains. And the reason being, again, incredibly smart people behind the project but they form the tokenomics incredibly well. You've got your Luna token and your UST token. 
So your stable coin basically is being collateralized by Luna. And so Luna gets burned every time a new UST comes on the market. UST is a algorithmic stable coin pegged to the US dollar. And um, it continues to gain a ton of traction because probably as you know, the US Securities and Exchange Commission is really looking hard at regulating stable coins, which isn't really, uh, um, I don't think a, a big uh, deal with anybody, but the problem is, is once they start to put their governance into any type of project, it, it really starts to, uh, to, uh, to put a, um, anyway, it thumbs up the system a lot. And with UST, you've got an algorithmic stable, stable coin, which nobody can govern, which is great. So that's kind of where the crypto space lies is that there shouldn't be any one governing body, any country, any person it should be governed by the community as a whole. And what you'll notice from all of these projects, Polkadot, Solana, not so much as, uh, as Polkadot and Cardano, but Polkadot and Cardano have a decentralized government structure. Cardano especially was founded on the fact that it, it is um, a foundation based out of Switzerland. And at some point, the entire IOG community, the input output global, which basically did most of the development on Cardano will slowly start to fade away and the governance system will come into place. In fact, that's happening here shortly in 2022 where they start to roll out their governance system. Polkadot, as Gavin Wood alludes to as well, the Polkadot token is used for three main things, one being government governance, the other one being staking, and the third one being bonding when you do transactions inside the network. That's kind of how Cardano works as well. Avalanche is a really great um, uh, project. It's more geared towards the DeFi space, incredibly fast transactions, incredibly inexpensive. They announced their avalanche rush about two months ago, and they're putting hundreds of millions of dollars behind that. So there's going to be some great DeFi projects. There already are some that are online. You've got Trader Joe, um, Yield Yak. Uh, there's a couple of other ones that I've um, participated in and done some yield farming on. I really like Avalanche. It's skyrocketed here too in the last couple of weeks, and it probably still has a way to go. Um, as a whole, I mean, there's a lot of crypto is is in its infancy. There's a there's going to be a lot of developments. Obviously, it's going to be volatile, and there's going to be a lot of things that happen in the next couple of years. But as a whole, it's got you know that one direction that has been going is up. And you know, Bitcoin as a whole has gone up from its inception in 2008 till today, on average 36% per year. So there's been nothing like that. And if you were in early, you really reap the benefits there. As a developer, right now in the in the development ecosystem, where it comes to most blockchains, I would think that you probably want to focus as a developer right now on you know, you're probably going to want to have a solidity background. Most of these projects are going to have some type of a smart contract language that's made on solidity. You've got Cardano, which is using Plutus right now, and uh, which is based on Haskell. I'm not sure as far as Avalanche goes. Polkadot, you can have just about anything to the, uh, the pair chains can pretty much work independently. So developers um, are really starting to move their way off of Ethereum just because it's so expensive to test and it's so expensive to uh, roll a project out with gas fees, you know, being as high. I think I had a $195 gas fee the other day on Ethereum um, and it was it wouldn't have been so bad, but it was for a $45 purchase. So the entire thing came out to like $240 and, um, you know, three quarters of it was based on gas fee. So in Ethereum has that problem right now that if you're not doing incredibly large transactions on Ethereum, you're paying a ton of money in your transaction fees, which Ethereum uses to uh, for their proof of work system. It goes basically to the miners to help them do the computations that it takes to place those blocks in the system. And nothing, um, nothing bad about Ethereum. It's just that's the way that it was built. It wasn't really built for this type of um, of use, the amount of use that goes into it obviously is uh, really started to skyrocket. And therefore, in order to get the, the transactions process, the amount of processing power needs to go up and the, the cost needs to go up around it. But Ethereum is trying to combat that, like I said, by having their proof of stake system here rolled out, hopefully in the middle of 2022. 
a good price to buy into Cardano. I don't give any advice when it comes to pricing. I think that everybody needs to figure out which product, which project they like the best and how to uh, go about utilizing, you know, the, the systems around it. You can do a lot of different things when it comes to just about any type of blockchain project, like from staking your Polkadot and uh, staking your Cardano. Uh, you can stake your Solana. You can do lots of different things. So Price wise, I don't have any targets for what I look at. I know that from this summertime, when I first got really involved in most of the blockchain projects till now, everything has done incredibly well. Um, I think that again, we're in the infancy when it comes to cryptocurrencies and blockchain projects as a whole. So we'll probably see a lot more appreciation. There's going to be volatility. Like I said, there'll be the downs, you know, and there'll be the ups and hopefully there'll be more ups along the way than there are downs. So UST is basically the Terra Luna stablecoin. The way it differs from USDT, USDT is the um, Tether coin. USDT was one of the first stable coins that was out there and is pegged to the US dollar. It has had a lot of really bad press because they were supposed to have assets on hand to cover their issuance. And as you can see from the amount or the uh, valuation of USDT, it's valued market cap wise at about $75 billion, which means that they should have $75 billion somewhere in the bank or in some type of a, um, uh, an equity position that would account for the $75 billion of issuance. They're not supposed to be issuing currency out of nowhere, right? Just like how the governments around the world do where they just print money and print money. USDT is supposed to have underlying value pegged to the US dollar, just the same as a lot of the other uh, pegged currencies do. The nice thing about UST, which is the Terra stable coin, is that it is algorithmic, which means that it doesn't have those assets on hand. It's pegged to the Luna prices. So every time UST is minted, Luna goes away. So that's one of the really cool aspects to it is that UST can't be regulated. It, no regulator can jump in there and say, oh yeah, we need to see where your books are and how much you've got on hand. It's not based on any type of fiat currency. So that's the really cool thing. More people are moving out of USDTs, USDCs, DAI, the uh, stable coins that are there and into UST. And as they do that too, the Terra Luna coin goes up because it's, uh, again, it's deflationary. And every time somebody gets another UST, Terra gets burned. So you've got your other meme coins that are out there. Somebody had asked about Dogecoin and Shiba Inu. They are meme coins. There's a purpose for them, just like everything else. They, uh, you know, you, you had meme stocks that really took off. They, uh, there was no underlying value really in some of them, but once you got a crowd behind them, it's all based on supply and demand just like with any economic system throughout the world. So when you have that incredible demand and the supply is fixed, even if that supply is incredibly large or inflationary, the value goes up. Um, you, there's always gonna be that when it comes to any type of currency or any type of stock or any type of basic asset that's available, real estate as well. When you have that demand and there's a limited supply, you're always going to have it go up. So some of the coins that are out there, you have to really make a determination. Is it based on the utility and the function of the token itself, the underlying blockchain technology, or is it based on hype? And is it based on just market sentiment? The market sentiment coins are more speculation, but they do go up incredibly high, just like you know from some of them out there. Um, the projects that are based on um, sound fundamentals and tokenomics and other characteristics that give them value. Obviously, most people believe that those are going to have a lot higher valuation over time. So you've got your underlying, you know, your Ethereum's, your Cardano's, your Solana's, your Polkadot's, your, you know, you name it. They're the ones that have that underlying utility typically are going to have a, uh, a better long-term prognosis, pr prognosis than the ones that are just based on hype at the moment. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of great technology that's happening. There's a lot of really cool things that are happening around just about all blockchain projects that have underlying utility. Each one of them is vying for their own niche in the market. So you're not going to have an Ethereum killer, which a lot of market pundits like to say, or a lot of 
YouTubers or, or content creators, who's going to kill Ethereum? Nobody's going to kill Ethereum. Ethereum is going to be around for an incredibly long time. It was one of the pioneers on the scene. It continues to evolve and it will always be one of the big boys that is playing on the block. There are going to be other projects that come up, but they need to prove themselves over time. Um, Polkadot needs to prove themselves. Solana needs to prove itself. Cardano needs to prove itself. Each one has its own piece inside the market and there will be a lot that happens, but there's not going to be one coin to rule them all. There's not going to be, you know, the one project, the one underlying blockchain. There's going to be a lot of projects that happen and they all need to operate and they all need to play nicely with each other as well. So um, the quicker that that happens and the easier that it becomes for people, that's when the entire crypto space will really launch into orbit. I really think that people need to keep in mind that it's so difficult to even get involved in crypto that most people in mainstream, they might own a, you know, a partial Bitcoin, they might own a little bit of Ethereum, but that's just about it. It's taken a long time for me to understand the types of projects that are out there and some of the underlying fundamentals to be able to speak intelligently on what's happening in the space, but it's really difficult to not only find where, where to buy some of these tokens, but also to how to get them onto a wallet, how to stake them, how to use them and yield farm with them, how to move them into different protocols in and out without spending an arm and a leg for transaction fees. So once it becomes much more ubiquitous and you have a mobile app that allows you to hold all of your coins in one place, to be able to see everything, to be able to use them and, and uh, do all the things that you'd wanna do with them, that's when it becomes more mainstream, when anybody can get in there and, and do the things that they really want to do. But I love the fact that, you know, the Cardanos, the Solanas, the Polkadots and other ones are, are very cutting edge. And they're really starting to push the envelope when it comes to what can happen when it comes to crypto and blockchain as a whole. So keeping up with cryptocurrencies, I find the best way to do that is to pick the best projects that you like. Um, in my case, I really fell in love with Cardano, and I love the fact that they're shooting to change the world. In fact, Charles Hoskinson often says, you know, we're here to change the world. If you come with us, we'd like to change the world. That's, that's their underlying goal. They want to bank the unbanked. They want to give IDs to the people that are basically nameless right now, and they want to put everybody on the same equal playing field where you're not born into one type of a, a society and there's another society that is just uh, you know, going to be completely alienated from what's available and what's out there. So I love that fact. And, and it's really forced me to look at some of the other projects and what makes them unique and special and how they compare and contrast. But you'll find that there's a ton of content, however deep you want to get into it, every single one of these companies and every single one of these projects has a story and you just got to find your story. And I actually loved watching Axie Infinity come up through the, the ranks over the summertime. You know, they started as a, a, a tiny little game and I have friends and family that live in the Philippines and talk to them about Axie Infinity. And that's just a, a blockchain game, but it's gone incredibly crazy and really focused in on how people are going to um, be able to bring themselves out of you know, difficult economic situations and be able to play a game and earn hundreds, if not thousands of dollars from it just by getting a crypto token that's tradable for other currencies and you can do other things with it. So there's a lot that's going on out there and, and uh, it's, it's only going to get bigger and better you know, over the, over the next couple of years. I'm going to take, let's see, one more question and then I'm going to finish up here. If you guys have any other questions, comments, anything that you'd like to know, please feel free to put them in the comment section or feel free to direct message me. You can um, also to reach me. I'm going to post this on YouTube when I'm done. So you'll be able to see it there. And um, if you missed anything or there's somebody you'd like to share it with, please feel free to do so. Uh, let's see. Let's finish up with as far as the, you know, there's, there's so many different blockchains out there and there's so many different things. I don't know about all of them. I know that there are lots of different projects that that um, are great. There's lots of projects that aren't, but I usually focus in mainly on the top 10. And the only ones that I really don't know a whole lot about are Binance Smart Chain, 
which is basically a centralized um, blockchain that allows people to do transactions incredibly quickly for a tiny amount of uh, money. And obviously the Binance um, exchange, which is a, uh, a centralized exchange for cryptocurrencies is the largest crypto exchange in the world. Coinbase being the similar one here in the United States that most people use and Binance has their own US version of it, but it's not as great as um, I would hope it would have been. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of coins and it's a, a lot different than the way that that uh, Coinbase and Coinbase, Coinbase Pro work. The um, XRP project, I really like. Unfortunately, the SEC filed a lawsuit against them and they really kind of halted their, uh, their trading ability in the US. As soon as that lawsuit's over, and I know that you've probably seen tons of content about this if you follow the XRP project or if you're an XRP holder, the, the project's amazing. It's going to skyrocket. It's one of those things that XRP, what some people may know or what some people might not know is that it had a higher market capitalization than Bitcoin in 2017. It passed up Bitcoin for a couple of days and was the market cap leader. And it's uh, got incredible technology behind it and a great team. And the, the ledger is really good. It does everything that you'd want. And it's going to be one of the mediums of exchange for central banks and for financial institutions. It's got a, a really robust financial background and allows people to do things instantaneously across borders that you know no other blockchain project is really focused on. But but Ripple Ripple Labs behind the XRP project unfortunately has gotten a bad press from their, their lawsuit with the SEC, although they continue to make tons of inroads in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. And um, again, after this is settled at some point, even if it goes, you know, the opposite way, XRP will be a, a huge project to be dealt with for, for a long time to come. You know, you've got your USDC stablecoin, again, which is the same pretty much as your Tether. Um, USDC is backed by Coinbase and, you know, is, uh, is trying to um, become the, the de facto standard for stable coins, although I much prefer to have an algorithmic stable coin. And then you've got your, your meme coins. So your Doges, your Shibus, and, uh, and them that are, are really based on really fun <laughs> memes and market hype. And um, it's incredible to see that, you know, you can get coins into the $30 billion range by just the, the fact that people believe that they're worth that much. But the uh, tokenomics behind them and everything else is is uh, is different to say the least. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed everything. Again, make sure to give this a thumbs up, uh, share it with your friends. Let's continue to grow the community. If there's a blockchain project that you love that you want to find out more about, I'm happy to do some research and also have that as well. And if there's certain topics or other things that you want to see in an upcoming meetup, please let me know. Thanks for coming and enjoy the rest of your day.